Yeah, when we first got here um, to the the, uh, the cemetery, we went in and got uh, a map to find the, the actual marker for John G. Lake. And the lady said he was in a portion, each portion of the cemetery has a name. And she said he was in this portion here and it's called Seturnia. And, um, and so the Lord just kind of said, you need to know what that name means. And one of the things she mentioned is there's been a marker for years for people to find John G. Lake's tombstone. And the marker is a gigantic tree that you can kind of see the stump of in, our, in the background. And we found out that this week a storm had went through here and actually caused that tree to be knocked down. And so when we got here, um, Joel looked up the meaning of that name. And that meaning of that name actually means um, generation, sowing of seed, or birth and origin. And so we, one of the things we felt the Lord was saying about the tree falling is that it was actually, unless the seed fall to the ground and bear forth fruit, it cannot uh, reproduce. And so even the area that John G. Lake is buried in actually means the sowing of seed for a generation to bring forth a new birth. So here is the tree and the grave site of the Reverend John G. Lake. Um, he had healing rooms here in Spokane, Washington. I just really, we just really feel like we're supposed to stand here. And we just declare, Lord, that there should be a platform, that this is a platform, uh, and we just honor yes. what has been done, that we will stand upon the foundation that's already been uh, established, that the wells, we will redig the well, Lord, that we will honor it, and there's going to be a season of breakthrough. Hello everyone and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Today we are going to be continuing our midweek video series on the fraudulent activities of the early Pentecostal movement. And you know, I'm thinking about renaming this series because as we move forward, we're going to be talking about more than just fraud. There were some really dark things that took place in this early movement. And uh, talk, and I'm talking about torture, and I'm talking about death, and downright murder that went on in this early movement. And we're going to be discussing that those things as we move forward. The men of the early Pentecostal movement are called generals. They're called generals by modern charismatic leaders because supposedly they were these great these men who were greatly used by God. Well, the fact of the matter is, is well, many of them were frauds. And their doctrine led to violence. And we'll be talking about that as we move forward. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this series is because, well, we've gotten um, a lot more subscribers. And perhaps some of the newer subscribers haven't heard of these guys. Or maybe you've heard of them, men like John G. Lake, John Alexander Dowie, Charles Fox Parham, and others. Maybe you've heard of them, but you've always heard of them being put in this positive light. Well, folks, history tells a different story. Sure, they did some good things, but there are some really, really just horrible things that took place uh, within this movement by some of these men. And we will be talking about that as we move forward. Now, our last video, we talked about John G. Lake. Actually, the last two videos, we discussed John G. Lake. Last video, we talked about um, John G. Lake and his son Otto being arrested in 1924 for blue sky fraud. Uh, Lake was selling false securities to people in his congregation, and uh, he was arrested for it. And so I'll put a card to that video at the end of this video. And so if you haven't seen it yet, you can just click on the card and you can watch that. Today, we're going to be talking about Lake again, but we're going to be discussing a miracle, a supposed miracle that took place while Lake was a missionary in South Africa. So you probably have heard it. This is the most popular miracle that I've, I've, that I know about Lake. Um, this is where Lake was um, in South Africa. Uh, supposedly the blue, the bubonic plague was just rampant, running rampant. Lake was um, burying people, taking people out, burying them, but he wasn't catching the disease. And the doctors were baffled about that. And so what did they do? They call Lake over. They say, hey, what's going on here? You're not dying. And so many people are dying. And 
And Lake just says, well, you know, hey, I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got the law of the Spirit of Christ that's working through me, and, and that's what's keeping the, me from dying. As a matter of fact, why don't you take some of the foam from one of these dead bodies, put it in my hand? Like, somebody would really do that. <laughs> Uh, let's go take some of the foam from one of these bodies over there. Anyway, that's what Lake did. Take some some of the foam from one of the bodies and put them here. Put it here in my hand and put a microscope on my hand here and and uh, you'll see the the bacteria. You'll see the bacteria die. The germs will die right before your eyes. And that you know that that, that was supposed this this great miracle. And it's told all over YouTube. It's to, written in books. It's 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 everywhere. So. Anyway, that's going to be discussed today, but I am not going to be the one discussing this supposed miracle. I was listening to the Love Six Scribe podcast last week by host Dawn Hill, and Dawn did a podcast episode on this topic, and she did a st- Stellar job, man. She refuted this miracle so well. She just tore the thing apart. Dawn has a background in science and in the medical field, and um, she herself was, is, was formerly in the um, New Apostolic Reformation. She has repented, come out of that, and uh, she's speaking out against it now. So I will put a link to Dawn's podcast in the YouTube description. I want you to go over there and subscribe to that. That is just an amazing podcast. Also, um, she has a YouTube channel, and I'm going to put the link to her YouTube channel in the video description as well. Head over to her channel, check out her video, subscribe to her channel. And uh, yeah, so I've reached out to Dawn and Dawn said that uh, she would be happy to allow me to share this episode here on, um, well, here on this channel. And that's what we're going to do today. So without any further ado, here is Dawn Hill from the Love Sick Scribe podcast refuting the bubonic plague miracle. Well, today I wanted to delve into a well-known account from a man considered one of God's generals, and that man is John G. Lake. Now, some of you may have heard his name. Maybe you have not heard his name. I actually heard his name uh, a number of times over the years in the movement that I was part of, and actually I had to take a class when I was in the Bible college that I've talked about before, but I believe it was in the second year I took this class, and it was a class that was called God's Generals, and the textbook, I'll put that air quotes, the textbook that was used for that class was Robert Slayerden's book, God's Generals, the first volume, which talks about people such as Amy Simple McPherson, William Branham, John Alexander Dowie, John G. Lake, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, A. A. Allen, Mariah Woodworth Eder, and talking about them from the perspective of, well, they weren't perfect and, you know, they were human, but they did amazing things for the Lord, really propping them up to be as if they were generals. And that term is still used today, even in this movement that um, I was in, that certain people are looked at as generals of the faith or generals and in what they minister and and how they lead people. And so I wanted to talk about John G. Lake today. I had been looking at some videos done by Daniel Long for Long for Truth, and he has some excellent videos, by the way, that I would encourage you to check out if you don't want to take my word for it. And I'm going to preface this by saying, whatever I say here today, I want you to test it and to do your own research, to look at these things and to think through them. Because the whole point of this episode today and this exercise is to get you really thinking biblically and also to implement the critical thinking that we are supposed to have as Christians. And this is a very well-known account. Uh, There's people even still today in deliverance ministries and in the prophetic ministries and then the the apostolic ministries and stuff that still talk about this particular account. And they use it as an example to say, we should have such great faith. There were people that even talked about this during the coronavirus, using John G. Lake's example of this to say, we should be doing this too. And yet 
we didn't hear anything about people doing this. So um, I want you to to think about this as we go through. Some of this is going to get into a scientific level, but I'm going to keep it basic. I, I do have a, a scientific background. I was a biology major and I also was a veterinarian. So I do have some background in this science. Now, I am not an expert in this, but I can give you some of the basics to it and help you to understand some of this. And I also want to encourage you to stay in the word. And by the way, this is not an episode to say, well, God doesn't heal and God doesn't do miracles and God doesn't sovereignly do what he wants to do. That's not it at all. Rather, it is to say, maybe we should look at these claims and make sure that they are truly honoring God and that there is truth behind them. So it's not a tall tale to elevate a man or woman to a position that essentially is idolatry. Now, the account that I'm about to tell you that pertains to this has to do with the bubonic plague that Lake alleges died in his hands when he was in South Africa. I want to read an excerpt to you from God's General's book from Robert Slairdon. And it's about John G. Lake in this. It's on page 182 of this book, and it talks about the plague. So I'm just going to read this section to you so you have an idea of some of the reports that are coming out about this. And then we'll play some video clips for you of other um, modern day people that are substantiating this, or should I say perpetuating this claim of this bubonic plague. As the team landed on African soil in January of 1910, a plague was raging over portions of the nation. In less than a month, one quarter of the entire population had died. In fact, the plague was so contagious that the government was offering $1,000 to any nurse who would care for the sick. Lake and his assistants went for help free of charge. He and one assistant would go into the houses, bring out the dead, and bury them. But no symptom of the plague ever touched him. At the height of this horrible plague, a doctor sent for Lake and asked him, What have you been doing to protect yourself? You must have a secret. To this, Lake responded, Brother, it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I believe that just as long as I keep my soul in contact with the living God so that his spirit is flowing into my soul and body, that no germ will ever attach itself to me, for the spirit of God will kill it. Lake then invited the doctor to experiment with him. He asked the doctor to take the foam from the lungs of a dead plague victim and put it under a microscope. The doctor did so and found masses of living germs. Then Lake astounded the people in the room as he told the doctor to spread the deadly foam on his hands and announced that germs would die. The doctor did so and found that the germs died instantly in Lake's hand. Those who witnessed the experiment stood in amazement as Lake continued to give glory to God, explaining the phenomenon like this. You can fill my hand with them and I will keep it under the microscope and instead of these germs remaining alive, they will die instantly. This same power constantly flowed through Lake's hands into the bodies of the afflicted, bringing healing to the masses. The lightnings of God blasted all disease and infirmity. So I'll stop with that. There's one smaller paragraph that is not pertinent to this information, but this is the excerpt from God's General's book by Robert Slairdon. Now, I'm going to play for you a couple of video clips that are pertaining to this the same instant that people continue to perpetuate and talk about. And then we're going to look at one of Lake's writings or sermons that was edited from a book from Gordon Lindsay that dealt with his sermons on death, demons, and disease. And we'll take, we'll go and read a good little chunk of that from chapter 12 called The Law of Life and the Law of Death. But first, let's listen to two clips. The first one is from a clip from God TV, and you are going to hear hear Bill Johnson talk about John G. Lake in this particular account. Lake stayed in such constant communion with the Lord that it seemed not even a deadly plague could survive when coming into contact with him. He, he once took, uh, you know, the fluids from a, a dead person's body filled with uh, living bacteria, and he and he, the, the doctors, you know, uh, told him he's going to die, you know, by touching this stuff. And he said, put this under a microscope, you'll notice it's dead. And it's because he was confident that the resurrection of life in him flowing from him was greater than any disease attaching itself to him. And they did. They subjected it to a microscope and they saw he was exactly right. Everything died. Uh, The disease died when it touched him. You don't do that unless you know who you are, whose you are, and what he's commissioned you to do. The other clip I want to share with you comes from another video that I came across. This video talks about Lake's response to the bubonic plague and how it teaches us today. So let's take a listen to that. By the way, this is Robert Slairdon giving, um, I guess it was on an old television program, but this is Robert Slairdon speaking. Someone has shared this video on YouTube. So I just wanted to 
let you know who it was speaking so that way you had all the information. One of my favorite stories, when he first got there, he found that there was a plague in South Africa and people were dying, but the people were so scared of the people that had died that they didn't want to touch them and didn't want to bear them, scared that they would get the disease themselves. And that was one way that they could contract the disease that was happening there in South Africa. But Lake went out and grabbed the shovel and began to help bury the dead so that at least other folks wouldn't get uh, sick and die themselves. And the doctors came and said, man, do you know what you're doing? You know that you're writing your own death certificate out by touching these bodies because we don't know how this disease is contracted, but if you mess with the dead and you mess with them the wrong way without protection and different things, well, my friend, you're going to die. He says, no, when the disease touches me, it dies. And they think, yeah, right, there's something wrong with this. But he goes, no, the law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So that law that I have in Christ Jesus gives me power over this disease that causes death. He says, you can take the germ and put it in my hand and you can watch it die. And the doctors and the few scientists and now that have got uh, uh, listening to Lake, the Lake has got their attention, turn and say, all right, we'll do that experiment. And so they went and got some of the saliva from some of the people that had died and put it on his hand, put his hand under some special microscopes and begin to see that the disease began to die in his hands. And he never got sick. He was one of the ones that helped bury the dead and take care of the sick. And the doctor says, well, you've got something we don't have. And Lake goes, well, you can get it if you want it. It all comes through Christ. So now that you've heard just a couple of clips, and, I, and I'm sure that there's others you can find, I just wanted to play at least two. So I want to read an excerpt from a book that Gordon Lindsay edited that had to do with John G. Lake. And this is chapter 12, as I mentioned a minute ago, about the law of life and the law of death. So I'm going to read a good little amount of this because it, it pertains to this particular account of the plague. And then from there, I'm going to pose some questions that I want you to consider, that I've considered myself, and we're going to look at some, some facts. Okay? Chapter 12 says this. This is one of the sermons that John G. Lake gave. That law operates in the physical as well as in the spiritual. He's talking about the law of life and the law of death. A man is in a state of fear. Someone has typhoid fever. They are placarding their houses to keep others from getting in contact with that dread disease. Now, fear causes your mind to become subjective. When you are full of fear, your pores will absorb everything around you. You are drawing into yourself what is around you. That is the way people absorb disease. I was ministering one time where the bubonic plague was raging. You could not hire people for $1,000 to bury the dead. At such times, the government has to take hold of the situation. But I never took the disease. Operation of the law of life says this. Now watch the action of the law of life. Faith belongs to the law of life. Faith is the very opposite of fear. Faith has the opposite effect in spirit, soul, and body. Faith causes the spirit of man to become confident. It causes the mind of man to become restful and positive. A positive mind repels disease. Consequently, the emanation of the spirit destroys disease germs. And because we were in contact with the spirit of life, I and a little Dutch fellow with me went out and buried many of the people who had died from the bubonic plague. We went to the homes and carried them out, dug the graves and put them in. Sometimes we would put three or four in one grave. We never took the disease. Why? Because of the knowledge that the law of life in Christ Jesus protects us. That law was working because of the fact that a man by the action of his will puts himself purposely in contact with God. Faith takes possession of his heart and the condition of his nature is changed. Instead of being fearful, he is full of faith. Instead of being absorbent and drawing uh, everything to himself, his spirit repels sickness and disease. The spirit of Christ Jesus flows through the whole being and emanates through the hands, the heart, and from every pore of the body. You observe that we lay hands upon the sick for healing. What for? Simply that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that dwells in the Christian may flow through our hands into their body. We were praying for a sick woman last night when I saw the spirit of God strike. It flashed through her soul just as consciously as a stroke of lightning. I felt it in my spirit, and I know the one we were praying for was conscious of it too. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That is actually, just a pause there a quick second. That's actually from the book of Romans at the beginning of Romans 8, I believe in verse 2. We're going to take a look at that at the end of this and see what that scripture that verse in scripture actually means. Blake goes on to say divine protection during that great plague that I mentioned, they sent government ship with supplies and a corps of doctors. 
One of the doctors sent for me and he said, what have you been using to protect yourself? Our core has this preventative and that which we use as protection. But we concluded that if a man could stay on the ground as you have and keep ministering to the sick and burying the dead, you must have a secret. What is it? I answered, brother, that is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I believe that just as long as I keep my soul in contact with the living God so that his spirit is flowing into my soul and body, that no germ will ever attach itself to me for the spirit of God will kill it. He asked, don't you think that you had better use our preventative? I replied, no, but doctor, I think that you would like to experiment with me. If you will go over to one of those dead people and take the foam that comes out of their lungs after death, then put it under the microscope, you will see masses of living germs. You will find they are alive until a reasonable time after a man is dead. You can fill my hand with them and I will keep it under the microscope. Just pay attention to this wording, okay? Because I'm going to come back to this <laughs> as we talk. You can fill my hand with them and keep it under the micro, and I will keep it under the microscope. And instead of these germs remaining alive, they will die instantly. They tried it and found it was true. They questioned, what is that? I replied, that is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When a man's spirit and a man's body are filled with the blessed presence of God, it oozes out of the pores of your flesh and kills the germs. Suppose, on the other hand, my soul had been under the law of death, and I were in fear and darkness. The very opposite would have been the result. The result would have been that my body would have absorbed the germs. These would have generated disease, and I would have died. You who are sick, put yourself in contact with God's law of life. Read his word with the view of enlightening your heart so that you will be able to look up with more confidence and believe him. Pray that the Spirit of God will come into your soul, take possession of your body, and its power will make you well. That is the exercise of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, as I said before, and hearing about John G. Lake and many other of, uh, quote, God's generals that were to be like set to, to be set as examples for us to follow, to look up to and to emulate. Now, as an outsider looking into this, I have quite a number of questions. As I think about this cr from a Christian standpoint and also from a person that has some understanding of biology, of microscopy, of medical background, now looking at this story and instead of just swallowing it hook, line, and sinker, I tend now to look at it and go, mm, I actually know better about some of this stuff. And so I have questions to ask. And as I went through and then started looking at some research, I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to say this up front before I get going with questions and also addressing some things that are going to, to bring some questioning into this entire account. I realize that there are potentially people that are going to listen to this from, from this mo moment forward, and they are going to be very upset at the fact of the things I'm going to say. They're going to be upset at the questions I'm going to pose. They're going to be upset and I, that I'm touching a sacred cow, the God's generals lineup. I understand that. I would encourage you that your faith is not in a man or woman and that we are not to put these people on pedestals. We are instructed and commanded in Scripture to test the spirits, to test all things, and to, to be willing to be fair and to be honest and to be objective about these things so that we don't just hold to what somebody said that the account that they gave that's just been perpetuated and there's no documentation to back this up. There's nothing to substantiate this. And actually there's there are things to the contrary that do not support what this account says. All right. So I'm going to present some of these things to you. Please test them. Please do your own research. Please don't get a <laughs> please try not to get upset with me if John G. Lake's one of your heroes that you look up to. I understand that at the same time, we are to look to Christ. We are to follow Christ and to imitate Christ. We're not to imitate John G. Lake. And after some of the things that I've even seen about him, aside from this account, I don't want to imitate John G. Lake. I don't want to imitate any of these people. It's bad enough of having to be faced with my own shortcomings, my own failure, my own sin and error in the past. And thankfully, that's been washed away by Christ. But to to even to imitate Christ daily and to follow him, that's that's what we are called to do. So I want to say that up front, knowing that there are people that are going to be upset about this, but please just hear me out and listen and test what I'm saying and test this account. Here are the questions that I want to ask and some thoughts that I want to pose to you. Why did John G. Lake not resurrect the dead in this account? This is talking about a massive plague, the bubonic plague. And yes, we will talk about that in case you don't know what the bubonic plague is. If he had so much power and it's the law of the the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is operating through him, why not just resurrect these dead people? I mean, Lazarus was in the tomb for three days, so he and he stunk 
you know, the people were afraid to pull the, the stone aside because they said that there would be an odor. Why is he not resurrecting these people? That would be a far greater thing to testify of, would it not, of resurrecting the dead? Why was he carrying out the dead and burying them? And he was talking about that there were mass graves, that they, they were burying three to four people in a grave. Why not just resurrect them from the dead if you have the law of the spirit of life in Christ residing in you? Why not just do that? If the, if the, uh, why not, re- why did he not rebuke the plague and heal those who were sick? And the focus on this account is of the plague dying upon contact with Lake's body. So why not lay hands on those who were ill and kill the plague within their bodies? Uh, the account also varies in, in it, it being relayed. Some have said that it was the bubonic plague. Others, as I will talk about in just a little bit, say that it was not the bubonic plague or black death as what bubonic plague was called, but it was actually black water fever. Well, what is that? We'll get to that shortly. Are there any newspaper articles to substantiate this claim? I tried to search for some. I couldn't find any. Now, if you find one and you want to share it with me and email it to me, feel free to do so. I would think that I mean, there are pictures of Lake in South Africa at these tent meetings and such. I would think that he would have someone there that would photograph him while this is taking place. These are questions we need to ask. I mean, this would have been big news. This is this is a miraculous thing that's taking place. Was this not in the newspaper? I would encourage you again. I mentioned Daniel Long a few minutes ago for Long for Truth on YouTube. Stephen Kozar is another one that has worked with him. I would encourage you to go look at their work. Daniel Long has actually dug extensively into the newspaper clippings back in the time uh, when these men were around, Alexander Dowie and Charles Parham and uh, John G. Lake and, and others. And there are news clippings about these people. Some of them are in a positive light, but there's some things that you may not know about these people that have not been told to you if you're in this movement. And some things are conven- seem to be conveniently left out. And there's some really disturbing things that are attached to John G. Lake and Dowie and Parham and others. They've done extensive research on this, and they're a really good research source to check out and you can test it there for yourself do your own research and, and and validate it as they have another question i would pose is is there any discrepancy with the time of the plague to lake being in south africa we're going to get there in just a little bit how would one look at a human hand under a microscope and see bacteria dying this is a question that i begin to ask myself because of my background with science, with with biology, and with medicine, I began to really sit and think about it and realize, well, I know there's a couple of different micro, there's actually several different types of microscopes, but how would you see bacteria dying in, in, a, in a human being's hand? How would you reach that level of magnification to be able to do that, let alone in the time of the early 1900s? I mean, the technology has has drastically changed and it's gotten more sophisticated over time. And even you can digitize and hook up a microscope to a a computer, probably through a USB port, and you can actually see it on the screen. So things have changed now. It's gone electric, of course. It wasn't electric during the 1900s, if I'm not mistaken. They actually used mirrors to bring light into the microscope. So these are things that we need to be asking. And just because I'm asking this does not mean I don't have faith for God to heal, by the way. I know some people may even make that comment or make or even think that of, well, she doesn't have any faith to even believe that God can heal. Oh, actually I do. It's just that I'm using critical thinking, which is not prohibited in scripture to do so. And God gave us a brain and he expects us to use it and not be just blindly led along and, and believe lies or believe fabrications. He wants us to test all things and make sure that they are testifying of him and that they're not drawing attention to a man or woman and that they're li- flat out lies and fabrications that have nothing to do with what he did. So that was another question I had. Um, How would you do that? How would you look under a microscope and actually see bacteria dying in, in a person's hand? Were the bacteria stained to see them? And if they were, this would have killed them. Now, I'll mention this real quick. Even in the line of work that I did as a veterinarian, we did what was called gram staining. Now, there's lots of other stains that some of the um, pathologists will use that are more specialized depending on what types of cells they're looking at and what types of things that they're wanting to see on biopsies and, and fine needle aspirates and such. But gram staining is a typical thing that's done. And in, in order for gram, st- and for gram staining, what you're essentially doing is you're using three different dyes and they're being washed and, and whatever type of bacteria it is, it's going to retain a certain stain. If it's purple, it's going to be gram positive. If it's, if it's more pink, it's going to be gram negative. And bacteria have different shapes. Some are round, some are safety pin shaped. So you kind of get the idea with this and you're, you're looking at, at these things 
You can look at yeast. Yeast has more of like a, a snowman appearance or a bowling pin appearance to it. But you're staining these things and looking at them under oil immersion, which is on a compound light microscope, that is 100x. That is the highest magnification on a compound light microscope that you find in a private practice, a veterinary practice, such as what I worked in, but it's the highest level that we could reach there in just our general practice. Under oil immersion, you could actually see bacteria and yeast. So this is the question I asked, were the bacteria stained? Because it is very difficult to see bacteria unstained under a microscope to see what you're looking at. Bubonic plague is actually safety pin shaped when it's stained. So um, under a microscope, you would have to stain it in order to see it. And if you have to stain it, it kills the bacteria when you stain, when you gram stain. And lastly, and most importantly, what does the reference to the law of life and death mean in the context of scripture? And again, I want to save that for last because that is a very important thing to understand. When you're taking scripture and making it t- mean something that it didn't mean in the original context, then it's really not, on- it's not honoring God. And it's not teaching people and leading them back to the truth of the word of God. It's actually leading them to John G. Lake and how great he is and how he was able to do the miraculous. And we don't even know if this story is true or not. So let's go ahead and delve into some of these questions. So in order for us to cover this topic, we are going to have to look at some scientific information. And I want to present these things to you to get you thinking and to apply critical thinking when presented with such claims. And when dealing with such spiritual matters, the authority of Scripture is of utmost importance and authority. And when looking at natural aspects of these matters, we can apply knowledge obtained that will help us in our understanding of scientific claims, such as Lake's claim of the plague dying in his hands. Having said that, let's take a look, for example, at the compound light microscope. Now, the compound light microscope, I found this on an educational site, and it has this explanation about a simple light microscope that I just shared with you. It says, simple light microscopes of the past could magnify an object to 266 times, as in the case of Leeuwenhoek's microscope, who Leeuwenhoek was the first one to create the microscope, I believe, if I remember right. It was the first microscope was created in the 1570s. Uh, Modern compound light microscopes under optimal conditions can magnify an object from a thousand times to two thousand times the specimen's original diameter. So microscopes are very beneficial for us that have been in the medical field to be able to see things in a cell, to see them at that cellular level, and to get an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, It was even helpful when I was looking at parasites and other things too, because parasites are small, depending on intestinal parasites and and, and other such things, uh, looking at ectoparasites, fleas, um, lice, mites, different things like that. It, the microscope is helpful to, to have a magnified look at it. Now, there is a type of microscope that did exist. Um, it was invented in 1677, so it would have existed in that time in the early 1900s. It's called a dissection microscope. And it's... Um, The ones now are light illuminated. Uh, The image that appears is three-dimensional. It is used for dissection to get a better look at the larger specimen. You cannot see individual cells, though, in a dissection microscope because it has a low magnification. If this account took place, we don't know what type of microscope was used. If it was a compound microscope, meaning they did not have the electricity then, they functioned in order to have light illumination. They had a mirror in the bottom of them to reflect the light upward to see through the the glass slides and to see the specimen. Light is important in these light microscopes, these compound microscopes. If you do not have a way for light to get up in the microscope and go through the objective, there's a few different objectives. There's the 10x, the 40x, and the 100x. If you don't have that capability, you're not going to be able to visualize bacteria, fungus. Um, You're not going to be able to uh, visualize any types of cells whatsoever if you don't have that light source. So in the early 1900s, when I've seen pictures of these microscopes, they did not have light capability as far as electrical. It relied on a mirror reflecting light. If they had a dissecting scope, they could have seen the surface of his hand, but bacteria is so so small, guys, you cannot see that under a dissecting scope. The magnification is not good enough to see bacteria in a person's hand and, and it see it dying. So this is not adding up. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry to bust the bubble from the right out of the gate, but this is not adding up. You're, you're just not going to be able to see that with a dissecting scope and you cannot put a human hand under a compound microscope or compound light microscope. If you do that, you block out the light and you see nothing. 
So that doesn't work. The other thing too, I mentioned about the, the magnification um, that you need to see bacteria uh, for a light microscope or a compound light microscope is a thousand X magnification. And this is the one that requires the oil immersion. This is the hundred X oil immersion. And so this was on another website. It says, while some eukaryotes, such as protozoa, algae, and yeast, can be seen at magnifications of 200x to 400x, most bacteria can only be seen at 1,000x magnification. This requires a 100x oil immersion objective and a 10x eyepiece. Even with a microscope, bacteria cannot be seen easily unless they are stained. And then we go back to the, the question of, can bacteria be seen under a microscope without staining? No, they can't. They cannot be easily seen unless they're stained. And then it goes back to the, the issue of with staining it with gram staining, it kills the bacteria. Now, when I started doing some digging about this whole issue with the bubonic plague and the account with John G. Lake, there were things I came across that really started throwing up even more red flags to me. And this is a, someone's opinion, but I found this on um, a WordPress website where someone had shared the, the bubonic plague testimony. And this one uh, individual commented, and he made a reference and said there were multiple, quote, there are multiple documented reports that prove the biography of John G. Lake is inconsistent. Documents from that time show he was considered a fraud who made up stories of healing to raise funds in the U.S. These things do go on. Uh, and for us to to think that they don't, we're being naive in thinking that. But these things do go on in order to try to validate somebody's ministry. I would just encourage you to look into that. The, this person went on to say, these accounts come from other Christians and missionaries. Also, government documents from the CDC and South Africa references show the plague was over by 1909 in South Africa. Lake arrived in 1908. Most historical references detail the deaths that were recorded occurred between 1901 to 1904. There was no confusion about what the plague was by 1909. Additionally, by 1900, the cause and treatment of the plague were discovered under the microscope in 1894. By 1897, a controversial vaccine was shown to kill the bacterium. That's a good little amount to say there in a paragraph that I came across in a in a blog that someone commented on with this. So then after reading through this, I began to start combing through the search engine online and started typing in uh, Johannesburg because it was Johannesburg where Lake was located mainly. Johannesburg bubonic plague. And I began to find that what this person was actually saying was verified. This, this person's comment that I came across in a, web, in a blog post, in a comment section, this person's comments were verified more than Lake's. Now, the bubonic plague, I want to get to this and in, in in just simply tell you what it is. The bubonic plague, also known as Black Death, probably a lot of us have heard of it, If especially in school, we heard about um, the plague that went through during the Middle Ages, uh, the 1300s, and it killed uh, massive amounts of millions of people. But the plague itself, uh, this was off the clevelandclinic.org. So their definition for the plague was, it's an infectious disease caused by a specific type of bacterium called Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis can affect humans and animals and is spread mainly by flea bites. So that's how it's mainly spread. That's the bubonic plague. And it gets its name from the swollen lymph nodes caused by the disease. The nodes in the armpit, groin, and neck can become as large as eggs and can ooze pus. Now, there are other types of plague that are associated with the bubonic plague. There's septicemic plague, which happens when the infection goes all through the body, through the bloodstream. Uh, hence the, the first part, septic or sepsis. Pneumonic plague is where it infects the lungs. And this is where it can potentially, depending on who you refer to for, for information and depending on <laughs> who you deem trustworthy, uh, but the pneumonic plague that it's found in the lungs, this is where it can potentially be spread from person to person. Some resources such as the CDC that I found, it said that it talked about that human contact with this or human transmission was rare with human with uh, in the pneumonic plague. And then others didn't specify that. But when searching, there was no mention of plague in South Africa in 1909. There was an article I came across for historical review from the CDC website, and this was written in January of 2018 in their Emerging Infectious Diseases magazine, uh, it looks like. It's from volume 24, number one, January of 2018. And the title of this article is Pneumonic Plague in Johannesburg, South Africa, 1904. 
So as you're reading the initial part of this, probably more considered the abstract uh, portion of it, it said plague is a potentially dangerous re-emerging disease because modern outbreaks are relatively infrequent. Data for epidemiologic study are best found in historical accounts. In 1905, the Rand Plague Committee published a report describing an explosive outbreak of 113 cases of pneumonic plague that occurred in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1904. And then they talk about the data that they use. I'm not going to go through this whole article, but it talks about the the data that they gathered from this. This was in 1904. And in 1905, they were able to, to address this. There was a committee that addressed this. So when Lake arrived in South Africa, 1908, 1909-ish, the plague was indeed over. There is no mention, You can, and you can Google this or whatever search engine you want to use. There is no mention of a bubonic plague that went through South Africa in 1909. It's not there. Now, on another website I found that had to deal with epidemics in South Africa, and it talked about South Africa, ancestors, and family tree research. It says this about the bubonic plague. It said, bubonic plague was introduced into South Africa during the Second Anglo-Boer War in rat-infested fodder imported by the British military authorities from ports in South America and India, where the plague was raging at the time. So there was a indeed a third wave of this plague pandemic that was going through globally. But the thing is, when you say that, it's not hitting every continent and every country at the same time. It's going through like a wave in different places, depending on when it gets there and how transmissible it is. So the bubonic plague was going through. Now, remember, bubonic plague is not the same as pneumonic plague. Yes, it comes from the same place because fleas that were infected by infected rodents that's where it comes from. The fleas had to be infected by rodents that they've been feeding on, and then those fleas bite people, and that's where the plague comes from. And then we have the pneumonic plague, if it turns into that, that affects the lungs, and then that's the where it can potentially be transmissible from human to human. But bubonic plague in and of itself is not transmissible between human to human. It's from flea bites that are infected by rodents that were infected by Yersinia pestis. Now, this article I was reading to you about the epidemics in South Africa, it goes on to say, it is a disease, bubonic plague, is a disease primarily of rodents, South African harbors at the beginning of the century, teamed with domestic rats. As the rats died, their fleas left their cold bodies for humans, because that's what fleas do. They depend on blood supply. So if an animal dies, they jump ship, and they try to find another living organism that they can feed on. They left the cold bodies for humans, who developed first the bubonic and later the more fatal pneumonic form of the disease. Bubonic plague can be caused only by the bite of a flea carrying the infection from a rodent. The pneumonic form spreads directly from man to man by droplets from the mouth or nose. So if <laughs> Lake was there, when the bubonic plague was going on, that's actually a misnomer because bubonic plague in and of itself is not transmissible from person to person. It's the pneumonic plague that is. That may seem like a small issue to you, but it's really not because if if this account is true and and if it's authentic, then we need to be accurate with the account. And that is not accurate, let alone what I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Someone else is now reporting that it's blackwater fever, and that is has nothing, and that's not even a plague, and that has nothing to do with the bubonic plague. The largest outbreaks of plague occurred in Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Durban, East London, and Johannesburg. A total of 1,694 cases was reported with 947 deaths. With the wiping out by plague of the domestic rodent population of the towns and the isolation, particularly of the pneumonic cases, the epidemic came to an end. Unfortunately, as transpired later, the infection had spread to a veiled rodent, the gerbil, and persists among gerbils to this day, accounting for the occasional human case. Now, there was another article I came across. Uh, by the way, the third plague pandemic, I looked this up, and just to give you a time frame on this, the third plague pandemic that hit globally and hit different places at different times, because again, that cannot hit all at one time on all continents. It came. It started in 1855 and it ran through to 1945, hitting various parts globally in different countries. The global distribution of this third plague pandemic was noted to be in South Africa from 1899 to 1902. Isn't that interesting? Now, there was another article that I came across, and, and I'm saying that because, keep in mind, Lake is reporting that he arrived in South Africa when? 
1908, 1909. Robert, Robert Slayerton's book says 1910, January of 1910. So between 1908, 1910, he was there. Well, according to the sources I'm finding online, this is saying that the plague was over in South Africa by 1902. And then there was another case of it in 1904 that hit in Johannesburg. It was a smaller isolated incident, it sounds like. By 1909, 1910, there's there's no record of this happening when he said he was there. I did find another article that it's titled Plague, Gandhi, and the Parliamentary Clerk's Daughter. It's on a website called Her- the Heritage Portal dot co dot z a, and this uh, person had done quite an extensive background into Gandhi and this this particular area where there were uh, living quarters set up, so to speak, and these these nurses had come in to help with the bubonic plague that was going on and slash pneumonic plague. And the conclusion of this article, I was reading it, and it was focusing on the fact that it was in 1904. Once again, it's it's verifying this historical review that's found in the Emerging Infectious Disease Database from the CDC from, from 2018, this article. So the conclusion of this article from the Heritage Portal about Gandhi and the nurses that came to help, it says, from the 19th of March, this is in 1904, to the plague's last death on the 9th of July and its eventual announced end on the July 16th, 1904, 113 cases of plague had been identified out of those 82 had died. The greatest death toll took place between March and April when cases were mainly of the pneumonic type. Over the period of the plague epidemic, there were 67 cases of pneumonic plague, 65 of which were fatal compared to 38 cases of the bubonic type, of which nine were fatal. Of the six cases of mixed pneumonic bubonic plague, all were fatal, as were two cases of septicemia, sorry. And so um, they talk about the greatest mortality occurred with those that had the the pneumonic plague in the lungs that was more um, transmissible to people, and that the majority of the group came from the Indian location and died within the first three weeks of the epidemic. And by the third week, the pneumonic strain had run its course and been replaced by the bubonic form. The RAND Plague Committee, we just heard about that a minute ago in the emergency, Emerging Infectious Disease article, they concluded that most of the pneumonic cases resulted from contact with another infected person, while those of the bubonic variety were transferred by infected rats. The mortality rate of the 113 cases was 72.5%, with 94% of those coming from the Indian community. So it goes on to talk about Gandhi's involvement in this and um, why this this plague occurred in the area that it did. I'll also post the, the link to that article as well, so that way you have that to look at. I'll post all these links in this particular podcast, so you can do your own research and your own homework, and you can verify these things. And certainly if you come across something that is contradicting this and and it verifies what Lake is saying, it's said about him and his books and his his document, his uh, account of this, then please feel free to share that. Now, one other thing I came across was the plague history. I found this on Elsevier's website. Elsevier is a type of medical site. They do a lot of medical books and such. I know that they do veterinary. I'm sure they do human medicine. But on their website, it talks about the plague history. And um, Yersin was the man who discovered the cause of the bacteria. So it's named after him, Yersinia pestis. He uh, discovered the bacterium in uh, 1894 and he isolated it in a culture. And in the subsequent century, there, there was a scientific progress in understanding the disease and the development of treatments and vaccines. So when I looked at this, there was a little bit of a timeline that they gave for this. In the first few dates, as I've already told you, 1894, it was isolated in culture. In 1898, they uh, found out that. Uh, uh, the bubonic plague had a flea-borne transmission, meaning that fleas were the were the intermediate host to carry the disease and transmit it to people. Um, in 1896, um, there was an antiserum that was used for therapy. In 1897, the first vaccine consisting of heat-killed bacteria was developed and tested for Yersinia pestis. So having shared all of this information with you, the evidence would seem to point to the fact that Lake was not even in South Africa at the time of the actual bubonic plague going through South Africa, as it is reported to have ended around 1905. And for those who may question this conclusion, I encourage you to do your own research, as I said, and to even look into the other areas of Lake's life where discrepancies exist and can be verified even by way of newspaper clippings. The The scripture that comes to mind is in Timothy, where a minister is to be above reproach. And sadly, this is not the case uh, with Lake. I say that not in a way to disparage him or to be disrespectful, 
But we do need to acknowledge this because this is this is simply it's not showing to be true. There's nothing to ver- to verify this, to validate this, and it's really again propping up a man and elevating him to a position when we should be looking to Christ for our encouragement, for our hope, for the the one that we are to to imitate and to be conformed to his image, not to Lake's image. So what about the claim that it was Blackwater fever? There was a YouTube video that I came across of this man talking about John G. Lake and the Blackwater fever plague. And so I listened to it because I I was I immediately thought, well, this is completely different than what I had heard from these other people. So I'm going to take a quick listen to it. I want to share a little clip of it with you here. And then we're going to talk just a little bit about Blackwater fever. I think it's relevant to talk about this so that we understand there is a conflicting report in this. I don't know where this gentleman's getting his information. At any rate, I'm going to share it with you because we need to take it into consideration. So here we go. Go. Fast forward to 1909, there was another outbreak of a plague called the Blackwater Fever. Many people have actually reported that they thought it was the bubonic plague because bubonic plague was called Black Death. But this was Blackwater Fever. This fever was a very, very serious version of malaria. I mean, I'm no, I'm no doctor, so this is how I can put it. So a prominent teacher during this time in 1909, when this plague was at its peak in South Africa, a prominent teacher called John G. Lake. Many of you might know him. And he and his ministry team were predominantly in South Africa. So John G. Lake and a couple of other workers from the ministry went into the fields to make sure that they could help. Their role was to take the dead bodies and take them to places where they could be buried and in some cases even burned. It was not their decision, but that's, that was their role. Now I'm going to stop right there because he continues on in this video to basically relay the very things that uh, Robert Slayerton had said and such, and that John G. Lake had even reported uh, that were being said to him about being questioned as to why he wasn't getting sick. So what is Blackwater fever? Well, let's take a look at what Blackwater fever is. I actually found this on the website on Britannica. And Blackwater fever, also called malarial hemoglobinuria, Don't worry, I'm going to tell you what that is in just a minute. Malarial hemoglobinuria, one of the less common yet most dangerous complications of malaria. It occurs almost exclusively with infection from the parasite Plasmodium falciparum. Blackwater fever has a high mortality. Its symptoms include a rapid pulse, high fever and chills, extreme prostration, a rapidly developing anemia, and the passage of urine that is black or dark red in color. And that's where the disease gets its name. The hemoglobinuria means that the urea at the end means urine. Hemoglobin at the beginning means that there's hemoglobin in the urine, which is not normal. And it causes the urine to look dark red or even black. And the hemoglobin is what the the red blood cells carry through the body in order for you to have for your organs to be oxygenated. So the distinctive color of the urine is due to the presence of large amounts of hemoglobin released during the extensive destruction of the patient's red blood cells by malarial parasites. Patients frequently develop anemia because of the low number of red blood cells. The presence of blood pigments in the blood serum usually produces jaundice early in the course of the disease. And it talks about blackwater fever is most prevalent in Africa and Southeast Asia. And then it says that blackwater fever seldom appears until a person has had at least four attacks of malaria and has been in an endemic area for six months. Treatment for blackwater fever includes anti-malarial drugs, whole blood transfusions, and complete bed rest. But even with these measures, the mortality remains about 25 to 50%. By the way, uh, malaria is not contagious between people. Like pneumonic plague, the, the only way you could in theory, get malaria is if you were to receive a blood transfusion that the blood was infected with malaria. So this is not something, this is not a plague. This is the only account that I can find, the report that I can find, where there's a completely different disease process assigned to this account with John G. Lake. Everybody else is saying bubonic plague, which again is a misnomer. But Blackwater fever is a complication, not a plague. It is a complication of malarial infection, 
in the bloodstream of a person. And yes, it is fatal, but it is not contagious. So this would not agree with the que- even the que- it wouldn't even make sense to ask John G. Lake this question. Why are you not getting sick by carrying the dead bodies? Well, why would he? It's malaria. Now they may not have known that then in the early 1900s, but I mean malaria has been a problem for ye- for decades in Africa, from contracting malaria from mosquito bites. That's how it's transmitted is through mosquito bites, infected mosquitoes. So this this account doesn't even make sense as to why they would say this if if when understanding what malaria truly is. Now there was also a site I came across in my research where a testimony was given about Ebola and lake bringing healing and how he was laying hands on people and that he was healing them and and doing all these uh, all these miraculous things and saying that you know Ebola couldn't even kill John G Lake there's no <laughs> documentation that this was Ebola that was uh, taking place that was occurring and again we don't even have the proper documentation to say that lake was even there when the plague was taking place the last question i want to pose to you you know we've looked at all the other questions I pose to you, and there's some that are rhetorical that, you know, we can't answer. Why didn't he just heal the people? Why didn't he resurrect them if this was truly going on? The last question I think that is probably the most important one to ask is what about what Lake said about the law of life and the law of death? I want to take you to a website called gotquestions.org. This is a really good website to go to. I feel like that they word it much better than I could to you, and I'm just going to read you a good amount of it. But gotquestions.org is a really good website to go to if you have questions about things, if you're doing Bible studies. A lot of times you can find the answers to your questions there, and it may help you. But I just typed in about Romans 8.2, and lo and behold, this question came up. It said, what is the law of sin and death? Romans 8.2. Their answer is provided here. I'm going to read it to you. The Apostle Paul refers to the law of sin and death in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? In these verses, Paul contrasts two laws, the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit is the gospel, or good news of Jesus, the message of new life through faith in the resurrected Christ. The law of sin and death is the Old Testament law of God. The law is holy, just, and good. But because we cannot keep God's law on our own, the result is only sin and death for those under the law. Romans 7, 5 explains Paul's focus on the law as leading to sin and death. That verse says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. In contrast, the way, or law of the Spirit, is noted in Romans 7, 6. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The law itself is not sinful. However, the law defined sin and stirred up our natural rebellion against God's rule, resulting in sin and death. Romans 7 verses 10 through 11 speaks of how sin, death, and the law are connected. It says, I have found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For in for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. This death refers to spiritual separation from God. Shackled by our depraved nature, we naturally opposed the law, and we found that God's life-giving word served only to sentence us to death. It is because of this that Paul can refer to the law as the law of sin and death. The conclusion of Romans 7 shows the need of the gospel to deliver us from the consequences of sin under the law. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans chapter 7, verse 22 through 25. The next chapter, Romans 8, begins by declaring there is no longer any condemnation or judgment for those who are in Christ. We have been released from the law of sin and death. Paul's argument from Romans 7 transitions in Romans 8 to a rejoicing over the change the gospel makes in the lives of those who believe in Jesus. The chapter concludes by confirming, in the strongest term possible, that believers can never be separated from God's love. And they quote Romans eight thirty eight through 39 here, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
So now understanding what Romans 8, 2, pointing us in a, in a biblical direction of what Romans 8, 2 means, we can see here now the contrast of what Lake was saying versus what scripture is actually pointing to what it means in the proper context. And the things which Lake stated are very much in agreement with the word of faith teaching and not in agreement with what scripture plainly says in context this topic. He noticed that he kept pointing that it was a law, that faith is a law, and that you have to believe. If you don't believe enough, if you believe that you're going to get sick, then that typhoid germ is going to um, absorb into your pores, whatever sickness, that you have to be on guard with that, that you need to operate in the law of the life of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, because if you don't, then you're going to absorb germs. That's word of faith talk. That's new thought talk. And essentially, that's like new age type talk because they've adopted that too, that you that whatever you say, it has power, that you speak things into existence and you call things that aren't as though they were in, in the word of faith. And, you know, we've talked about that before. Romans 4, 17 is not us talking and, and saying things that aren't as though they were. That's God doing that when you read that in context. So we don't have that power to do that, regardless of what anybody tells you. We don't have that power in and of ourselves. And this is not what Romans 8 is talking about anyway. It's talking about the gospel versus the law of sin and death, which has to do with the fallen nature of man. So what is the purpose of this topic? I mean, you've just sat here and you've listened to probably a lot more about biology and science than you really wanted to know. And you probably may or may not be upset with me at the end of all this because I may have ruined one of your heroes that you had in the faith. What is the purpose of this topic? Why even talk about this? Because we need to get back to the truth of the Word of God. That's why. And we must remember to be good Bereans and to test what is being taught and claimed by anybody. And just because something is stated over and over and written over and over and regurgitated over and over by well-known people does not make it true. We are also to utilize critical thinking and testing things against Scripture. And it is also important that we know the fruit of one's life claiming to do such miraculous wonders and that we are not idolizing or desiring to emulate fallible people who are conducting themselves, whether in a manner worthy or unworthy, of the gospel of Christ. We are to follow Christ and to be conformed to his image by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Men and women like Lake have been set upon a pedestal, and their lives have become the high water mark to attain. And this is idolatry. We look to the Lord for our instruction. We look to his word for godly counsel and guidance into all truth, and we do not take personal accounts and make them the gospel. And that is the concern I have with accounts like this, is that we have made these people's lives the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is Christ-centered, and it is about his death, burial, and resurrection that he did for us and atoned for our sins, what he has done to redeem us and reconcile us back to the Father. That is the gospel. The gospel is Christ-centered. It's not Lake-centered. It's not Wigglesworth-centered. It's not Mariah Woodworth Edder-centered. Uh, it's not Amy Simple McPherson-centered. It's not Branham-centered. Thank goodness it's not centered on any of these people because they are fallible people. And we need to be testing everything that is told to us by people and making sure that the fruit of their life is matching up with what agrees with the Word of God. I hope that this has helped you today. Maybe it's challenged you. But as always, I hope it's encouraged you. I hope it helps you even more to be a better Berean. Be blessed today by this word.